Okay, thank you. Thank you all for coming, and thank you, some of you have been here longer, for your patience, and I hope you enjoyed some socializing while you were waiting. Um, I'm always so happy when the room continues to fill up and people are enjoying each other. It's, it is hard for me to break it off, um, but it's time. It's time for what we all came together for. Welcome to Poetry at the Albany Library, and I always give my special thanks to friends of the Albany Library, without whom we would um, not be doing this. Um, they, their, their volunteer work really supports this program, so we thank them very much. So tonight is, um, is really special to me. Um, I, um, rather by accident, um, uh, was, and, and, it, and it's, it's just been, was a marvelous thing, um, went with Alan Soldovsky, it's, it's a logistical situation, to hear Robert Sward speak, or, or read rather, a few months back. And um, it was quite wonderful to hear Alan talk about how he had first met Robert Sward as a young student and that Robert Sward, I think you all know who you came to hear read. This is Robert Sward's book. This is Alan Sadowski's, and pretty soon you're going to see their faces too. Um, so Robert Sward was Alan's first teacher at Iowa Writers Workshop, his first poetry teacher. And I just thought it would be so much fun to bring the two of them together. Both of them have wonderful new work out and of course they're continuing to work and share with us. And so I think without further ado, I'm going to introduce Alan Sadowski whose latest book is In the Buddha Factory, and it just is really quite marvelous. Um, and he is already at work on a new book of poems in progress, um, which we might be treated to some new poems tonight. All right, so Alan Sadowski, welcome. I'm going to uh, read a, a mix of some poems from In the Buddha Factory and uh, uh, a few things that I'm working on for a new collection. Um, and thank you, thanks to everyone for, for coming out tonight. And it's great to see so many friends from so many different parts of my life in the audience. I'm very pleased to be here. Um, I'm going to begin with a poem called The Sense of Place that Joyce Jenkins has published in Poetry Flash. And uh, it's um, part of the California poems in, in In the Buddha Factory. 10 a.m. Towers along Market Street mirror the sky. The street still in shadow, almost in another climate. I'm swept up in the crowd that pours into the Palace Hotel, where in 1930, Warren G. Harding died, some conjecture from poisoning. After Teddy Roosevelt spent the night in Yosemite on Glacier Point, he said, bully. John Muir and the Hearst newspapers made it famous. A place is more real when you imagine it. In Yosemite Valley, there are three hotels. In the meadows beneath the monoliths, buses run every five minutes. Hordes walk amid the oak and cedar. I attempt not to notice. Good luck with that, right? I'm one thing in one place, something else in another. When I drank champagne on the deck in Belvedere, gazing at the houses on the hill above the harbor, I felt oppressed by the beauty. The skyline across the water, too bright despite the overcast, my eyes numb with the bone-white glare of summer. Drake dropped anchor a few miles from here. He wrote of a month of stinking fogs, 
and named the headlands he scavenged New Albion. Some claim he missed the bay altogether, that he marked his damp, bitter days farther north, lost in some colorless recess of time. It's important to learn the birds' names. Now I'm going to quote from the, the, the uh, uh, great Russian um, short story writer Isaac Babel. A man who doesn't live in nature as a stone does or an animal will never in his life write two worthwhile lines. In the central Sierra there are Stellar's Jays, Western Tanagers, red-breasted sapsuckers, solitary virials, chipping sparrows. I can't identify them without a guidebook in my pocket. Birds learn their songs where they are born. The fledgling duplicates its parents' call in the deep nostalgia of the branches. When he was caught in the brambles, my then two-and-a-half-year-old son, Adam, pointed to the blackberry thorns and excitedly repeated his new word, prickles. It became a joke between us. When he didn't want to go to bed, he'd repeat it so I should remember running terrified through the neighborhood, calling him. I found him one street over, scrunched down behind a house overgrown with trumpet vine and jasmine. Roosters and morning doves call through the dawn beneath the roar of jet planes. This place was once called Rancho de San Antonio, deeded by the King of Spain to Luis Peralta. What we call hills are not hills, they are mountains. Yeah. Thank you. So my, uh, my son grew up and he actually became a poet and uh, he's about to become a father in about two weeks, which makes me, I guess, grandpa. Um, yes. This is another story. This is another story with, 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 my, with my boys in it called Country. We're out in the cuts, my son says. The boondocks, they used to call it. We're looking for a way back to the tollway, but we're getting nowhere. We're somewhere near Aurora, Illinois, land of Wayne and Garth, where kids come home to live in the basement. <laughs> In the back seat, my other son asked, how many ways are there to use rat fucking a sentence? <laughs> Let me think, I say. To cut the pensions of retirees is to, I'm sorry, to cut taxes again for the rich is to rat fuck the entire country. <laughs> to cut the pensions of retirees is to rat fuck every employee in the company. Despite my best efforts to be cheerful, my face is a map of worries. I get lost staring in the mirror. Nothing looks the way it does on TV. But what can you do? I drive into the long twilight, the dipper slowly unveiling itself over us. The sky is no protection from this anxious yearning to be elsewhere. Along the road, trees rear up that look like smoke, gray pines with needles that appear no more than a smudge of feathers. We look for a sign to Naperville when we come to a bridge over a greasy river covered with fingerprints of the moon. A star streaks through the night's jelly, another, then another. I've always thought to get something, you've got to give something up. But out here where the earth is flat enough that you can see the argon glow from the National Laboratory on the rim of the horizon, you get nothing. You just get to give something up. <laughs> it's sort of a Midwest. <coughs> Visiting the Midwest again poem. This is a, um, a poem that, that could have happened. It's called Attraction. These things happen. Attraction. At the restaurant, 
the light pooled in her hair. And about her shoulders, the scent of verbena lingered as we sat across the table, posing there, savoring the other's look, covering the other's silence. The wine at last urging us past the perimeters of our strangeness, letting little flickers of conversation flare, the glow of our words wreathing our faces through dinner like an aromatic smoke. Yes, she said when I asked if she would share dessert. By then, even our spoons clicked. I didn't want to go after the waiter cleared the coffee and tried to think of something I could say so interesting or inexplicable. It would keep her from announcing it was late, that she had an early appointment. I shouldn't expect her to go home with me. It was too soon, my poor tongue, too unreliable. I was in trouble. So I asked if she would like to share a cigar. <laughs> a writer I knew she'd heard of sent me from Cuba. Yes, she said, if I walked her to her car, parked far across town, which I did, walking through, walking with her through the night that promised nothing more than to hold us a while in its arms. And then, of course, after attraction, there's always fall this, this <laughs> season. So here it comes. And I tell, I guess I tell true stories, more or less. Fall, what I can remember. Do you know how hard it is to see you walking around every day on this strip of 14th Street in the village of perpetual beginnings, where the dry cleaners spills its shafts of neon onto the puddled concrete? You invent want. Suddenly I'm reminded that people are like pumpkins, that they rot from the inside out. So I Better, so I'd better thank Victoria Chang, from whom that line was stolen, for remembering Larry Levis, who broke every decent piece of stemware in my house, doing his Mick Jagger imitation at 2.30, for God's sake, in the morning, the divorce after party finally winding down. I didn't want to move the contents of the hutch anyway, and once it fell, it was part of the fallen world, left to mix with the 10,000 shards of rain the air would carry. This is the time of year the sun is paralyzed, clouds lowering the edges of the sky. How can I live without you as the warmth slides out of the asphalt while my grip grows looser and my skin too tight? And um, I tried to put myself in a situation um, as many people do in libraries, of being maybe one of the less fortunate. So I wrote from the, from the point of view of, of one of those people, um, but I'm also thinking of, of, the, of the author, uh, Herman Melville. I'm also thinking of the, CAD, the card catalog system that the UC library uses called Melville. So the poem is called Melville, sort of unspecified who this Melville is, but you'll hear his voice, whoever he is. You cannot loiter long in this downtown library branch without being asked what you're looking for. I said, I always wanted to read the lives of the squids. The librarian mentioned that there were three volumes. She looked me over like I was an olive in a root beer glass. I'd rather do origami than read about the construction of innocence in the 19th century. I'm not a formalist, but I can read inscriptions on a crypt as well as the next guy. I'm tired of living on salt, salt pork and whale fat, bored with looking into the dead mouths of suilacanths. She looked at me as if I had taken something unspeakable out of my pocket. She said, she could look up mollusks on her computer. 
cephalopods I corrected. That's when she explained that there was a prejudice in this district, dependent as it is, as it was on the bovine economy. Excuse me, I said. I said the truth was that I had recently fractured my knee, which caused me to speak on several topics at once. What was I saying just now? She looked so sweet then, so terribly thin. I barely stifled an impulse. I suddenly had to touch her ear. I'm sorry, I said, but I had lost my thought. As she tilted forward, I could see her forehead's waxy gleam, her pasty white neck, the light slipping down the modest slope of a breast. Oh, I was lost. By the time I came to my senses, I realized I was standing inside a whirlpool. There was no way I could go back to what I had been doing, parsing sentences, doing piecework. I had to shape up. I had been drowning in pages of water, living in a group home. Surely I knew the truth slanted. What sad harpoon had I lashed myself to? On what bone had I been gnawing? I consented to the doctrine of filth only because what else can one do? How could I have not seen the taxi cabs idling, their signs turned off? It was time to go by then. The air was being shut off a little at a time. There was a lance in my side. She was saying something. She was telling me a fable about obedience that I didn't already know. That's a little scary. Um, in my book, I, I had this sort of weird impulse. I had many weird impulses. This is just one of them to uh, place romantic poets around California. So I put Wordsworth on uh, the Pacific Garden Mall in Santa Cruz and had him read to with his sister and watch the surfers. And I sent John Clare to Santa Clara because after all, <laughs> Santa Clara. And I put, I put Coleridge in West Marin, so I'll read you <laughs> Coleridge. Because when I went to the Lake District, I thought, geez, this... It, this could be California. I, I got it. I got, I got what Coleridge and Wordsworth were doing when I went to the Wordsworth Trust and, and looked through Dove Cottage and got to look at an annotated uh, early edition that they had put together of Lyrical Balance. I thought, yes, they're Californians. So here's Wordsworth. Here's Coleridge and Wes Marin. Some of you may recognize this person. Addicted to the alphabet, he stays up nights. And mornings descends the path that winds past the lagoon to the narrow wedge of beach, his breath blooming in the wind. Unfinished pages on his desk, lines eroding like the cliffs that crumble more precipitously with each downpour into the rock-ribbed sea crowding the headland north of Bolinas. His cottage on the mesa leaks. The pot-bellied stove puts out more smoke than heat. Books heaped on the floor, about to topple drunkenly as haystacks. At his age, he wonders what he writes for. Crows roost in the eucalyptus across the road, feathers iridescent as the lining of a suit. He's quit the San Francisco scene for good. His wife and kids move to West L.A. He visits them occasionally unable to endure the curdled air or the miles of elevated concrete. He prefers a less encumbered location, inventing another self in the company of younger women, or observing an egret in the eelgrass, impossibly balanced, dredging his head through the water. Tall bird, he preys on whatever there is, small crabs, fingerlings, anything he can slide down the hose of his neck. A bird doesn't want to know how good feeling bad can be, nurturing his hunger with the world in such abundance. What reason is there to be depressed? Christ, was anyone depressed before the 19th century? Or wine so damn much in verse about it? He's begun to think of poetry as a form of self-medication, a sort of substitute for love, 
Or is it a kind of self-advertising? On the way home, he'll stop at Smiley's for a drink before he enters the drizzle of afternoon. He thinks maybe he should spend more time out, drive to Marshall to hear the new dead offshoot, or start that idol on the new sewage plant. Oh, our bloody hell, just screw it. <laughs> so, um, I'm going to change pace a, a little and, and then um, read uh, some, some new pieces and then go back and finish with reading some of the poems that I wrote for my visit to uh, Zhejiang province in uh, the People's Republic of China in 2005. Uh, I was there for about a month. Um, but I, I want to stop and pause for a moment and remember someone who was dear to many of us, and certainly was to me, Carolyn Kaiser. And I think her presence as part of this community should be um, uh, uh, felt. I feel her uh, still, despite all that happened uh, to her. She passed, if you didn't know, uh, just a few days ago. October 9th. Yeah. This is one of her poems that I found on the, uh, somebody posted it on, the, on Facebook, and I'm very grateful, because I, I didn't know this one. It's called In the Night, In the Night by Carolyn Kaiser. There are spirit presences around my bed waiting for me to die. They are in no great hurry, nor am I. Do not fear death. I whisper to my keepers, fear life if it goes on too long, for the lost losers makes winners weepers. It's so quiet tonight, I can hear the angels breathing. Our hands are transparent, as veined as autumn leaves. I rest in their arms and sense the mist rising. So the new, one of the new things I'm working on, and it's, uh, I owe a debt to poets like Carolyn and, and to others who are here tonight, um, Jack Marshall and my, my great first teacher, Robert Sward, and my friend George Mattingly and my teacher, Jack Marshall, all, all wonderful poets, people who are part of the literary community, both of who I knew in Iowa and knew in, in California. And to my friend in California, Al Young, who taught with us at, at San Jose State so well, is that sometimes you have to say what happened. This is from Robert Lowell. So I'm going to read the first and the last part of a, of a long, it's a 25-page collage poem, kind of a documentary poem that follows the uh, predictions of the rapture. Um, remember Harold Camping? <coughs> Reverend Camping of Oakland? Christian Family Radio, he predicted the rapture. He was, he kind of got the date wrong. <laughs> and I thought I would sort of count down along with him and just sort of say what was happening. Um, as Lowell says, my, my epigram is from Robert Lowell, why not say what really happened? I try. So I'll read you just a little bit of this. It's a long, it's a 20, 27 page poem. So I'm just going to read a, a couple of sections. The, the best way to do this, I think, is the first section and the last section. So it begins on May the 11th and it ends on, on, on May the 24th. <clears throat> so here's what happened May 11th. I want to begin to say what I heard on the news. Though there were different versions, three people died, shot to death on the fifth floor of the 10th Street garage, the forbidding one where it feels you could vanish trying to get out. Some said the alert system didn't work or worked all right for some. Some heard six or eight shots and a few, a few in houses nearby said they heard two rounds of popping sounds. Dozens of others were on the sidewalk wondering what happened while others still in classrooms reported they heard nothing. We don't know anything yet about them, their names, their ages, sex, only that they were connected to the university, their lives unnoticed, announced by their deaths. 
It was reported that two earthquakes, 4.5 and 5.1, struck near the town of Lorca, Spain. 20,000 buildings damaged. The Red Cross said it took 350 ambulances to evacuate the town's two hospitals, a medieval town located near a fault that runs beneath the blue Mediterranean, where the European and African continents converge. The second worst occurring at 6.47 p.m. local time. That's 5.47 p.m. in London, 12.47 a.m. in New York, 9.47 in San Jose, CA. The garage blocked off, police still swarming. That's the time that the night classes get out on our campuses, 945. So, you know, I just sort of cry. I'll, just, I'll, read, well, I'll read one section from May 12th and then read the, the last section. So this is, this is me. You'll see why I'm reading this when you hear the last section. I take pills for what ails me. Like most men who've made it to 60, the Cinepril for high blood pressure yes. ran to dentine. <laughs> <laughs> ran it to Dean for acid reflux to kill the ratty aftertaste of esophagus. I don't sleep lying down tasting what gravity brings up. Kaiser wants to keep me alive, though I don't like them really. There are tests I avoid, though I know it would be wise to know what might be prevented from killing me, but I'd rather not. <laughs> yeah, tell me about this. So here's the last section. May 24th. My molecules have become confused. There's been a disturbance in the force. The LAPD announced they found the guy who beat the Giants fan, Brian Stowe, seven weeks ago. They found him because a parole officer thought his guy, a gang member with a shaven head, looked like the image on the poster. The guy had a new tattoo on top of the one that would identify him as the attacker. It didn't look right. Sixty years ago to the day, Ezra Pound was locked in a six-by-six six steel mesh cage on the plain north of Pisa, considered by the U.S. Army a dangerous person or a threat to himself. Unrepentant, he lived exposed on four sides in a death cell, his roof a metal plate. To prevent suicide, he was allowed no belt or shoelaces, sleeping on a slab with only thin blankets to stave off the cold nights and no books except the Bible. Pull down thy vanity, he wrote in Canto 81. Learn of the green world what can be thy place. His senses sharpened. He noticed each blade of each grass blade, each clover leaf that opened by his gorilla cage and the mint that springs up. Opening his lizard's eye, he wrote he was saved by an ant's forefoot. And three weeks after three weeks, the camp's psychiatrist found signs of imbalance. At the department graduation, I try not to double over at the podium from the hurt in my belly. The room at the periphery of my eyes is getting red. This is supposed to be celebratory, but it feels like a harpoon has been jammed through my colon. I don't tell anyone seated on stage with me what's going on. I make it through the speeches, the long oratorio of names, but something terrible is happening inside me. I excuse myself when it's over, joking, I have to go home to let the alien chew its way out. I'm not feeling well at all. Maybe I can sleep it off, but it gets worse. Pamela calls the nurse. When I start moaning at four in the morning, it hurts so much. It's all I can do just to lie there, writhing, imploring intervention by anything approaching the miraculous. It takes four firemen to hoist me off the mattress onto the gurney and into the ambulance. I'm yelling gibberish when they insert the IV through when they insert the IV. Though it hurts beyond belief, with a scalded voice, I repeat, I can't stand it, but I don't want opiates. By the time I, we get to the emergency, I'm blathering. The resident presses my gut, his skin like an embalmed rose. They claim to want to help me, but whatever they do hurts more. 
They finally give me something to unclench me. They need to look inside my body. They inject a die and slide me into the barrel of a machine that throbs like a spaceship. Then they tell me they need to get me into surgery, but they have to wait for a bed. Then they shave me and wire me to the monitors and dance through my arteries, chemicals that will knock me out and turn me into meat. The last thing I remember is a weird fluorescent taste. And the Australian nurse who flew back 18 hours to get to this operating room holding my hand as they strapped me down, she was saying they'd make a small incision to put the scope in, but in the end they couldn't. They did an open appy. When I woke up, they said it was gangrenous, septic, spiraling towards my expiration. It was a typo, those predictions of rapture. The prophecy should have read rupture. <laughs> a calculation not for the end of days, but for my day's ending. With my bilirubin rode me off the chart and my body clogged with toxins, to be saved, I had to be cleaned out. They sewed my innards back, but left me open, attached to a wound vac that sucks fluid out of the gash in my belly, a gaping chasm that won't completely close. <laughs> yeah, sorry about the heaviness of that one. Um, I promised I would actually I'll read, I'll read three poems. I'm gonna read two dogs in them because we have one of the one of the, the country's most notable and skilled dog poets uh, with us poet a poet who writes wonderfully about dogs so I'm going to ease into this with a, a poem from the new book called Dog and Suds which is remembering a little drive-in oh, yeah. yeah George remembers it <laughs> Dog and Suds in Coralville, Iowa yeah. this is a, a, a memory exercise poem Dog and Suds it is the heat that, is it the heat that's got me unhinged? My head hangs halfway out the window of a blue 58 Biscayne, its grill a chunk of serious chrome. We're cruising up the Coralville Strip after my weekly session with the doctor at the hospital for difficult words. Oily smell of asphalt simmering in the backwash of the breeze. We make a left against the traffic to pull into the drive-in. Then a squealing crunch throws me across the back seat. Four kids in a Ford Fairlane have smacked into us. Our car, hood levered open, shoved sideways in the middle of U.S. 6, sputtering. I'm all shook up, as Elvis says, but we're okay. Jolted rudely into the humidity. Their look says... It's we who cross the double yellow line. My mother, a new driver, indignant, while the kid at the wheel flips up his middle finger as he fishes out his license. He tries to take her on, but her voice is higher. It costs more than expected to have that for which we've been longing. Ultimately, we lurch across two lanes of highway and ease our injured fender into a stall to accept from the car hop a sticky window tray in which she places iced mugs of root beer, a glacial scoop of ice cream floating on top in the foam. We order Texas burgers and onion rings and extra pork tenderloin and fries. Nothing can surpass that feeling that we could live a long while on this. Though our vehicle is damaged and will take some time to fix, we've come close to something lethal. So we face, face each other with our mouths full. <laughs> That's, that, that just about says it. So, um... You probably all had the experience of being worried about a pet that you're taking to the vet. This is the second to the last one, and I'll close with the title poem of the, of the book in the Boo Factory. This one is called Novel. It's not that long. But I thought a poem called Novel, how, how novel. <clears throat> and I, I based this poem on the experience of a vet's waiting room. I took notes. So here it is, and, and, and all the dogs I met were in this poem. 
I wait at the vet for news of my cat, whether they'll need to take x-rays or not. I sit on a green plastic cushion and listen to his cries as they squeeze to feel his insides. A young assistant comes out wearing a smock like pajamas, sleepy eyed, brushing her hair's weight off her face, says they need to take one picture and draw blood. I can still hear him in the back and can imagine how scared he is because I am that way about everything that hurts. Then the Dutch door swings open and out flounces an Airedale in a teal bandana. <laughs> the owner, flouncing too, almost giggling, tugs on the leash and shouts, Come, Steinbeck! <laughs> at the beast, looking at no one in particular. That, it's the first time I've heard that name given to an animal. Happiness wags its tail beside her. A new dog comes in, a Samoyed, nervous as the blade of a windmill. He's called Clyde, a good name. His blue jean t-shirted owner leads him through the waiting room where he stops at the desk to chat with the just out of school receptionist. My head's filled up, a low grade fever. I sweat just enough to be uncomfortable, my skin slick as the wax coat of an apple. How not delicious this is to await the outcome, feeling the body's heat and darkness. Why would I speak to the new woman who's come in, overly made up in the tight sleeveless burgundy sweater whose chest juts out? Literature is preparation for a life never lived, so the critic says. So why do I wonder what her life is like with the two chihuahuas they bring her, yapping like a pair of thorns that dig into the silence, my privacy plundered. Oh, I'll never know what cuts her heart. She says nothing as she walks past, looking at the empty crate beside me, about what it feels like to be inside her body. And I don't want to know. I can't even imagine. All this to distract me, to keep me from thinking the worst things, the leukemia that lurks inside the city's bloodstream, the heart clogged with worms beginning to stretch their elongated mouths. I hear the call of the nocturnal, the plaintive whine of electricity feeding the clock. How am I going to sit here looking up at the basket of miniature Hershey bars wrapped in Easter colors before I begin to lose it? to pace up and down, my tongue lolling out. I start panting and fill my pockets. I get up to read the flea management brochures, the fluorescence <laughs> vibrating the way they do, my eyes suddenly stuttering. There is, this is something new. The hero wants to pause the story and have a snack. There's a clamor in the antechamber. A slinky Labrador nearly scales the counter. She's got the leash in her mouth. Finally, my gray 20 pounder comes out, collapsed into himself like an overwatered plant. They've injected saline solution into his back. It's made a hump, and I'm warned his legs and paws could swell up, not to be alarmed. He won't eat or drink, I say. Perhaps he has a sore throat. Perhaps his stomach hurts. It's been three days and we're no better than the sky perforated with pollen and a skeleton of rain. It could be allergies or an infection, who knows? Both of us are miserable, riding the wheel of misfortune. Is this new? Who will love us if we ask the world for it? So, as I promised, this, this is the final poem, and this is the in the Buddha factory. Um, Part of it takes place in California, and in the book, it's part of a sequence of, of poems of kind of chronicle my travels through Zhejiang province. But we had the privilege of being uh, escorted to uh, Mount Tiantai, the original uh, uh, site of the, uh, Tian, the Tiantai sect of Buddhism, which became Zen Buddhism in uh, southeastern China. And uh, before we went up to the monastery, we were taken to a factory 
where they were constructing Buddha statues, some very large. And we were taken to a showroom and offered a chance to buy uh, a, a, a statue. One of them is on the cover of the book. Um, a journalist from Singapore had taken this photograph. I'm not that good a photographer, but I stood um, in sight of this statue and marveled at how they were building it. Um, so this, is, this, this, this poem incorporates the, the visit to the Buddha factory. Form without a body, body without form, where we start and where we end. You remember ascending the hillside through the green expanse of afternoon, mist dripping off the ganglia of mulberry, a few pink blossoms already exploding, quavering in the low wind. In the temple, the abbot fished in his robes for his cell phone, surprised at such ringing in the world. In a cloud at the top of the mountain, he found a staircase leading down to a fat statue, leafed with golden moss, mouth open, laughing. So difficult to tell what is genuine. You saw hundreds like that one arranged for display in the showroom. Rows of them in various postures, washed in the commodious tinctures of commerce. Bodhisattvas, male and female, some with red fingernails, waiting to be sold to resorts in Las Vegas. Nearby, the world's largest Buddha is being assembled in a shed like an airplane hangar, its nose about the size of a Learjet. You can't help but bow and mutter prayers. It's good business, the manufacturer says, his own father, a believer. You couldn't know you were here to prepare for the hard silence ahead. When someone close to you labors for a breath, flesh dimmed, an insolvent spirit, the nurse feeding him morphine and ampule an hour, one eye lolling open as if to see beyond the light. Then there's you, rubbing a spot on the top of your head, looking away at a normal face on TV to distract yourself from death's disheveled taxonomy. Outside in the jaggy water of the marina, boats lull at anchor, repeating the sea's endless detachment from the weight of its occupants. Thank you. Oh, thank you so very much, Alan Sadowski and our sold off ski. I think I stick an extra L in there. I'll just my tongue wants the L in there. Um, and I want to thank both of you tonight for, for bringing such a wonderful crowd of people. And I, as I said, I was kind of inspired by, by hearing Alan speak about Robert as his teacher. So I thought this would be super cool for the two of them to read together. And this turns out to be an evening of many teachers and students happening upon each other here. So this is really, really fun. Um, and now we have Robert Sward. And it's really a great honor to be hosting Alan Sward reading from his new and selected poems, I believe. Um, yes. And uh, which came out recently from Red Hen Press. Um, the, this book, um, which you should definitely take a look at, we've got both books back in the back. Um, it includes poems that have never been published and other poems that span a career of over 50 years of writing. And um, Robert Sward has written in, in um, many different genres um, and very, uh, in, including journalism, very successfully. We are very, very fortunate that he has excelled so beautifully at poetry, um, it, having won many awards, having been a teacher in many places. And one of the things that um, I enjoyed reading very much was about 
the Iowa Writers Workshop's 75th anniversary in 2011 when they printed broadsides of Sword's poem, Iowa, um, as part of their celebration. Um, Robert Sword has always graciously given to his communities and his communities are multiple and it is really wonderful to have him here in our community, Robert Sward. What a pleasure, what an honor you know, to, read, to read to you. And I want to thank Alan for helping you set this thing up and for and to capture it. What a, what a wonderful, I've been looking forward to reading this at this venue. Um, Ram Dass says that the old age is harvesting whatever your life has been about. And uh, 50 years of writing, you know, scribble, 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 this is, this is the result of, uh, of that. Um, I'd like to start with, uh, I mean, the way Alan has set me up to read my dog, a couple, a couple of dog poems. <laughs> this one is called, In a World of No. All that I cared for was the race of dogs, and that and nothing else. To whom but dogs can one appeal in the wide and empty world? That's from Franz Kafka. And I don't know, for the last couple of years, uh, whatever I write seems to come from voices from, you know, from outside. In this case, these are coming from the dog, the dog is speaking. In a world of no, dogs are a yes. 68 million dogs in America, and they understand there's a fundamental human reaction to everything. And it's no, no. Arr. Dogs hate hearing shit like that. People, it's all no and no and no. They look at a dog sometimes, the dog is on its back, say, on someone's lawn, legs in the air, rolling and bouncing, this is the hand I was dealt, says the dog. <laughs> it's not a problem, but people, look at me. I don't have time for this, you're thinking? Something better is going to come later? No. No, it won't. As Ram Dass says, this is all there is. This is all you get. All knowledge, the totality of all questions and answers, is contained in the dog. Do you know who said that? Kafka. That's right, Kafka. Bow wow. Bow wow, bow wow now. <laughs> this is uh, my daughter's dog uh, named, named Shelby. And Shelby is saying, it's called the, the world according to Shelby. The world is going to the dogs. And I'm the dog the world is going to. Shelby here, S H E L. B Y. Lift your leg. What? You want my resume? Sniff here. Ruff, ruff. If I can smell your ass, I know what you've got up your sleeve. Now shut up. Shut up and let me bark. For starters, food has a way of anchoring thought. I'll tell you that. The stomach and the heart, they're the same thing. But I want to know, after 10,000 years of domestication, what does it mean to be a dog anymore? Of course, it's true. 90% of our genetic makeup is the same as yours. I read, I read shit like that. You need? <laughs> you need, but you think I need? Need what? An interspecies relationship? Give me a bow, give me a wow, give me a bow wow wow. Remember, your woof woof is connected to your bow wow. Be cool, love like war, winner is who stays longer. You know, sometimes it's just good to hang out with your own kind. <laughs> I was, I taught at Iowa for a while and uh, I was there also as, uh, as a graduate student and one of the first things I wrote in Iowa was this eight nine line poem. I'd grown up in Chicago, my father was a podiatrist. I was slated to become you know, a professional man. And uh, suddenly I found myself in Iowa and uh, looking about, uh, you know, just what the hell you know, really am, I, am I doing here? So the poem goes, what a strange happiness. Sixty poets have gone off 
drunken, weeping into the hills, I among them. There is no one of us who is not a fool. What is to be found there? What is the point in this? Someone scrawls six lines and says them. What a strange happiness. Uh, back to the dogs. <laughs> the purpose of dogs. Uh, Charles Darwin says, the difference in mind between man and the higher animals, great as it is, certainly is one of degree and not of kind. So the dog says, 90% of our genetic makeup is the same as yours. But you, my friend, 22 feet from your mouth to your anus. It's all right, boss. Dogs <laughs> understand. They know what it means to be human. Still, the doctor who said, the purpose of dogs is to stimulate the subcortical reward system. That doctor needs a doctor. Woof, fucking woof. <laughs> The purpose of dogs is for you to walk around after us with a little bag. <laughs> <laughs> so she'll be aged, as dogs will do, and um, it's a poem called Doggy Dementia. And I suppose the inspiration was the products that they tested on dogs to help people handle their, their dementia. And, and now it's been given to the dogs to help them because they, 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 they get into problems. Dogs get senile. So Shelby says, old border collie and I can't hurry shit. Don't see so good. Don't hear either. Gray around the muzzle and my coat is thin. 13, boss says. That makes me 91. What are we going to do with you, he asks. It's curtains, he's thinking. Time to take the leash off. Stars and moons and birds and trees, suns at your back, hearts on your sleeve. Likes it when I sing, boss strokes me. Each year, 2.2 million dogs lose their place, get stuck in corners, stuck behind furniture, can't get out. CCD, canine cognitive dysfunction. You people got a name for everything. You reading, boss? What you reading? Anapril works by increasing the level of dopamine. An essential transmitter has been shown to temporarily reverse some of the, uh, the changes of CCD and improve behavior in about 95% of affected dogs. Aricept for dogs. So, unconditional love, unconditional love on a leash. But they put a bell on me just in case. And here's boss calling, Shelby, Shelby, he says. Shelby is still Shelby, Shelby. Shelby is still Shelby, yeah. Right, my friend. Shelby who? <laughs> <laughs> so I mentioned my dad was a podiatrist, and um, I, I would, I, I want to say as a student, but as a, as a kid, I would go to see my father, who would uh, treat my feet as if there was something, whatever else was wrong with me, it could be cured by providing art supports and doing all the things that podiatrists do. It's also strange, I mean, I, I, whenever I read some of my, my podiatrist father puns, there's always someone or one or two people come up after the reading and tell me about their foot problems. <laughs> <laughs> so this is called God. <laughs> God is in the cracks. And um, dog says, not the, <laughs> I'm sorry. Dad, <laughs> just a tiny crack that separates this world from the next. And you step over it every day. God is in the cracks. Foot propped up, nurse hovering, phone ringing. Relax and breathe from your heels. Now that's breathing. So tell me, have you enrolled yet? Enrolled? In the Illinois College of Podiatry. Dad, I have a job. I teach. Well, I'm a man of the lower extremities. Dad, I'm 43. So what? I'm 80. I knew you before you began wearing shoes. Too good for feet, he asked? I, me, mind. That's all I get from your poetry. Your words lack feet. Forget the mind. Mind is all over the place. There's no support. You want me to be proud of you? <laughs> be a footman. Here, son, he says, handing me back my shoes. Try walking in these. Art supports. Now there's a subject. Someday you'll write about art supports. 
<laughs> this is one stop foot shop again with the father speaking and uh, his dad says we walk with angels and they are our feet uh, the, the idea here is you know that I'm sitting in a podiatry like a dentist chair or something and He's doing his thing, and the nurse is coming in and out, and it's his business as usual, and he's musing. We walk with angels, and they are our feet. Vibrating energy packets, he calls them. Bundles of soul in a world of meat. Early warning system. Dry skin and brittle nails. Feelings of numbness and cold. These are symptoms. They mean something. I see things physicians miss. All you have to do is open your eyes. Just open your eyes. And you'll see, seven-eighths of everything is invisible. The spirit inside the spirit. The soul is, S-O-U-L, the soul is rooted in the foot. As your friend Bly says, the soul longs to go down. Feet know the way to the other world. That world where people are awake. So do me a favor, dream me no dreams. A dreamer is someone who's asleep. You know, the material world is infinite, but boring infinite, he says, cigarette in hand little wings fluttering at his ankles, and women, he says, smacking his head, four times as many foot problems as men. High heels are the culprit. I may be a podiatrist, but I know what I'm about. Feet. Feet don't lie. Don't cheat. Don't kiss ass. Truth is, people's feet are too good for them. <laughs> <laughs> This is a, a, a piece called My Muse. Can it be okay in the back? It's, it's. Robert Graves in The White Goddess writes, As a rule, the power of absolutely falling in love soon vanishes because the woman feels embarrassed by the spell she exercises over her poet lover and repudiates it. So I'm fortunate to have my, my muse here tonight. <laughs> And the muse's dog. <laughs> so she says, why don't you just write a poem right now? Western wind, when wilt thou blow? Why did you write a poem like that? Like that anonymous, something inspirational. <laughs> Talk about muses. Yeats's wife was visited in her dreams by angels. I sulk. Angels have said, we have come to bring you images for your husband's poetry. Yeah, so what, she says. It's out of style. I already do too much for you. Odalesque in a wicker chair, book open on her lap, dry white Chardonnay at her side, hand on a dozing, bewhiskered sphinx. You need a muse, she says. Someone beautiful, mysterious, some long-lost love, fragile, a dancer, perhaps. Look at me. Yeah, I say, refilling her glass. You hear me complaining? You're zoftig. Zoftig? Firm. Earthy. Juicy, too, I say. Luscious, provocative, sensual, daring. Juicy plum, I say, in bed, left hand over her head. Rose petals, I say, right arm around her. Silver drop earrings, I murmur, ordering out for gifts. Aubergine scarf, gray cashmere cardigan. I do this in my sleep, go shopping in my sleep. Oh, yeah, in a case of Chardonnay, wake to the scent of apple blossoms. Decades in the glow of rose light. Wake, she whispers. I tell her my dream. We kiss. Poppy Express, racy red, red coral, star red, red red. Enough. That's enough, she says. Yeah. Some people <laughs> raise the question, how do you know when a poem is over? And uh, uh, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm in that same boat, but uh, Gloria's very helpful because she says, enough. And, uh, <laughs> that's, that does it. This is uh, actually for Gloria on her 60th birthday. We're looking for love in Miriam Winsor. When I get stuck, but when I, I, I'm, I'm looking for inspiration. I don't know where to go, so why not go to where the words are? And so I open up uh, the dictionary at random and uh, see what that leads me to. So I looked up Gloria's name in the, in the dictionary and looking for love in Miriam Webster. Beautiful, splendid, magnificent, delightful, charming, appealing, says the dictionary. And that's how I start. I heard her say, say, 
make it less glorious and more gloria. Imperious, composed, skeptical, serene, lustrous, irreverent, she's marked by glory. She attracts glory. Glory, I say, glory, glory. Is there a hallelujah in there, she asks, when I read her lines one and two. Not yet, I say, looking up from my books. She protests. Writing a poem isn't the same as really attending to me. But it's for your birthday, I say, pouting, playfully cross. That's the price you pay when your love's a poet. She has chestnut-colored hair, old-fashioned clara bow lips, moist brown eyes, arms outstretched, head thrown back. She glides toward me and into her seventh decade. Her name means to adore, to rejoice, to be jubilant, to magnify and honor as in worship, to give or ascribe glory. My love, oh Gloria, I do, I do. <laughs> This is, um, this will be a couple more because I know guys are running a little bit late for the open mic. Uh, a man needs a place to stand. Again, with the father speaking. Snap out of it, son. Yes, of course I'm dead. But do you think I've left the world? Then how come you're talking to me? Ask yourself, how is it possible? Listen to me. There's more good news. That's right. Death doesn't separate you from God. This is a surprise. You were thinking there's something to fear. Anyway, wait till you die, son. You'll see. We never entirely leave the world. Ah, there's no there to leave. There's hardly a here. And you, you just think you have a body. Still, you can't chase the invisible. Do that and you'll end up everywhere. And then what? A man needs a place to stand. <laughs> a little poem for my, for my daughter. Um, Hannah, who's going to be coming to, to visit us actually in a few days. It's, uh, we were taking a train ride from Vancouver across you know, to, to Montreal, having breakfast together in a little, little compartment, and uh, she managed to get some stuff on her forehead. Her third eye is strawberry jam, has a little iris in it. Her eyelids are red, she's sleepy, and the milk is going down the wrong way. I've just had breakfast with the smallest person in the world. And this is uh, Hannah a little later, a uh, portrait of an LA daughter, take one. Braided blonde hair, white and pink barrettes, Betty Davis gorgeous, I hug her, dreamy daughter with no makeup, silver skull and crossbones, middle, don't mess with me, finger ring, three or four others in each year, rings in her navel, rings on her thumbs, Gentle moonshine, pale, she announces to porno for pyros, formerly the group Jane's Addiction. Nothing shocking, with Perry Farrell, Dave Navarro on guitar, Stephen Perkins on drums. Ain't no right, they sing. What are you, some kind of a groupie, I say? She says nothing, just turns up the volume. I hold her, wet and wild lip gloss, diamond stud earrings and glitter on her cheeks. Wan, she's looking wan. My dancing daughter, Hannah Davi, a new name, walk on in the movie Day of Atonement with Christopher Walken, and a part in a Levitt's furniture ad, it's work, and a part in an MCI commercial, Best Friends, Breaking In, Brotherhood of Justice, Lost Boys, Private Lessons, a Swiss Alps barmaid, classic blonde Gretel in a Folgers coffee commercial. Grunge is in, she says, visiting Santa Cruz. Any good wills around? <laughs> I'm going to end on a poem called Turning 60. And it uh, has a little epigraph from uh, Schopenhauer who says, The first 40 years of our life give us the text. The next 30 supply the commentary on it. The first 40 years of our life give us the text. The next 30 supply the commentary. I don't know. It's, um, it says something to me. I'm still haven't quite figured out what. but <laughs> So... I'm turning 60. Um, I'm actually 81, but when I wrote this, I was turning 60. And uh, those, I, I, find, I don't know about you, but I find going from 49 to 50, 59 to 60, 69 to 70, and recently 79 to 80. I mean, that's, that's getting up there. 
And I remember years ago when I was teaching at Cabrillo College, my friend uh, Joe Strauss said, I, I, he learned that I was 60 years old then. He said, 60 is serious. But uh, 60 is serious, what, what are these, these other decades? <laughs> so grammar as hymnal, and as, a, as an English teacher, uh, you know, what are you going to do? I mean, I, I, I turned to what I turned to, which is a book of grammar. Seeking solace in a review of grammar, I turned to Strunk and White's Elements of Style. Standing at attention, opening to the section on usage, I chanted and sang, uniting my voice with the voices of others, the vast chorus of the lovers of English. We sing of verb tense, past, present, and future. We sing the harmony of simple tenses. We lift our voice in praise of action words and the function of verb tense. We sing of grammar, which is our compass, providing as it does clues as to how we might navigate the future. At the same time, it illuminates the past. Uh, now I'm, you have to bear, please bear with me for a moment. <laughs> I have it on the, on the well. I have my cards and it's, uh, Okay, I found it. I'll just back up a little bit. And it's, it's, it's just it's like about one, one page. I have some on the cards, and then the card went missing. So the final section, or the, or next, the, the penultimate final section, grammar is hymnal. Seeking solace in a review of grammar, I turned to Strunk and White's Elements of Style. Standing at attention, opening to the section on usage, I chanted and sang, uniting my voice with the voices of others, the vast chorus of the lovers of English. We sing of verb tense, past, present, and future. We sing the harmony of simple tenses. We lift our voice in praise of action words and the function of verb tense. We sing of grammar, which is our compass, providing as it does clues as to how we might navigate the future. At the same time, it illuminates the past. As a teacher, I talk as present. For 30 years as a teacher, I talked, that's past. It may only be part-time, but I will talk, that's future. And then the last section, very last section, living the future, perfect. I will have invoked the muse. I will have remembered to give thanks, knowing our origins are in the invisible and that we once possessed boundless energy, but we're formless and that we're here to know the things of the heart through touching. I will have remembered, too, that there's only one thing we all possess equally, and that is our loneliness. I will have loved, you will have loved, we will have loved. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, both of you, um, Alan and Robert, and we will now take a break, a, a very brief break, I think, like seven, seven to ten minutes max. Um, books are at the back, so please do look and buy brownies, restrooms, all that, and then we'll begin our open mic. Thanks. I'm, I'm going to interrupt the party again. And uh, please feel free to bring yeah. treats to your chairs. So we'll start the open mic. Um, may, could someone bring me the pad with the open mic names on it? That would be a good help. Let's see. Zoe, could you bring the pad? Oh, Jack has it. Okay. Okay, uh, first thing, I have a couple of announcements I want to make. Okay, I want to call to everyone's attention that our November reading will not be the second Tuesday. We have a very unusual and special reading. 
Um, Poetry at the Albany Library, together with Poetry Flash, is going to be presenting Gerald Stern, um, who has just uh, been named the 2014 Robert Frost Gold Medal winner for Lifetime Achievement in Poetry. And uh, he has a new collection out, Divine Nothingness, and this will be its West Coast um, debut. Um, so we have flyers on, about this at the table. On the back, um, you'll also notice, and uh, that that we will be moving to a larger venue, the um, Albany High School's Little Theater, which is very nearby. And uh, for those of you less familiar, or friends, all that uh, friends of yours, you might want to direct. There will be directions posted um, a little bit later. But the date that you need to to have in mind is the second. Friday, so not the second Tuesday, the second Friday of November, November 14. So, and you know, we just love to see you and all your friends. All right, my um, second announcement is for our friends at Poetry Flash. Um, there, a lot of the various poetry, you know, publishers and, and poetry collectives and and such have been having benefits recently and Poetry Flash um, is so has helped so many of us along the way and I believe has celebrated its 40th anniversary? Yeah, we're 42 now. Oh my gosh, so they're pretty grown up. I mean, <laughs> still starting, really spry, but yeah. We're starting to reflect. Yeah. <laughs> And they they need our they need our money too, and our support. And they've been working hard for poetry, and really have established this as a poetry community. Um, long time ago, and I can tell all of you that this my my the 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 poetry night here at Albany, as as I've put it together at any rate, would not exist if it were not for Poetry Flash because. Um, Joyce Jenkins and Richard Silberg were just holding my hand the first couple months. The first thing I did when, when uh, I took this on was I rushed down to Poetry Flash and it was like, Mom, Dad, help, I, you know. <laughs> and uh, they've really, uh, anyway, we all, we all owe a lot to Poetry Flash. So um, we have wonderful flyers at the back, but let me tell you, this is October 25th. So please put that on your calendar. It's soon. I know there have been a lot of events. This is really important for us to be supporting Poetry Flash, and it's going to be a lot of fun. It is a party. It is at a home in Oakland. The address is on the flyer. And um, Alicia Ostricker is going to be reading. So it's going to be a really wonderful, wonderful day. All right, and those of you who can't make it, you know, please support Poetry Flash however, however you, you can. All right, we have a fabulous open mic tonight, and lots of these people also happen to be poetry teachers, and um, one of them is an award-winning poetry teacher. First in line here is John Oliver Simon. This uh, poem is not a Hendeka syllabic sonnet of which I've been writing hundreds. Uh, I was in Mexico last month and uh, uh, riding a bus uh, from the DFA to Morelos, I, a previous bus ride came to my mind and, and this uh, poem came out. A couple of little snippets of fragments, subidas, bajadas, uh, autobus tres estrellas de oriente, three stars of the east, um, and uh, cena Oaxaqueña is a dinner you eat in Oaxaca. Any dinner you would eat in Oaxaca would be a cena Oaxaqueña. All night, the mountain road from Oaxaca to San Cristobal, coiled and twisted in serpentines, subidas y bajadas, 
swerving through hairpin curves, not a metaphor to translate literally into Spanish. And you by my side, perky, brave, nauseous, complaining, <laughs> while on the inescapable screen of the Autobus Tres Estrellas de Oriente, reminding us of the three kings who rode unsteady camels over potholes to witness the birth of nothingness. Michelle Pfeiffer, in a gringo movie that must have played in North American theaters for about a week, drove terrified across the rainy asphalt of a midnight bridge, while Harrison Ford, in a role he hopes Kenneth Turan has forgotten, rose from the dead in the back seat as an insatiable zombie, yearning to suck sweet marrow from the essence of Michelle as she skewed and skidded in a sinuous contrapunto, a rhythmic to the wallow and plunge of the autobus. And you and I held each other helplessly, hoping against hope that our Sena Oaxaqueña would remain firmly anchored in the depths of the digestive system until San Cristobal rose dripping from the underworld of the Mayan dawn, like a pyramid bearded with revolutionary dreams. Thank you, John Oliver Simon. Elliot Shane. Helen was a teacher of mine, one of the first ones, teacher, teacher, teacher student. My greatest teacher was Carolyn Kaiser, and I'm so grateful that you mentioned her. She's been on my mind ever since uh, last week. So I, I pulled this poem out, and I'd like to read it for her. Um, and I, and I want to say as a teacher, I mean, if you knew her, it was her presence. Her poetry is fabulous, but her presence was transcendent. And that's what moved me most. Responsibility. The day they told me I might die, a blue rose popped near my summer scribing chair. And there we were the rose and I, floating in the ocean, as, as the breadth of it warmed us, and the sky came down like honey's nipple. I reached out to touch the rose, for its beauty surpassed me, yet surely it would be gone sooner, and only I would be left to tell of its blue velvet petals, of the Queen's Castle without the stone. That's without the stone. I think I choked on that thinking of my dear teacher. Thank you so much. Um, Jack Marshall. Indian Summer, uh, I wondered why it was called Indian Summer. So here's a shot at it. Early October, suddenly as if summer's sun had more than ever within memory moved measurably closer, warm enough as it must have been for spirits of na Native American warriors doomed by knowing their extinction a matter of time, and not as on especially good terms with the god of time, to make one more raid and ridding their land of invading settlers, thus Indian summer. 
as if a cruel, insatiable will infused all concentrated heat in its grasp, and overnight every cubic meter of air loaded like a wagon sunk to the axles, stillest heat weighted like the law of vengeance in a solid state, as if we needed reminding, water, earth, fire, air, fine-tuning their transformations, and we left to gasp. I'll read um, one, one other poem. It's called Aleppo Winter. Barrel bombs, indiscriminate slaughter, midwinter, refugees fleeing across borders, nothing but gnawing hunger anymore. Horses in rank stalls that families hide in feed on more than their children will. And homesickness worsens, worsens horror of the present to yearning for their past apprehension, but less terror. I remember my mother saying, for her as a girl, Aleppo winters were like being caught in a river rising, and night growing cold as marble, freezing you in place, and every place in you was everywhere ice. She liked her talk like her cooking, spiced. When I once asked why she always expected the worst, I don't expect the worst, she said. I expect the expected. Memories meet, we eat, and keep repeating. Decades later, reading in Malaparts Kaput of a winter night in farthest Finland, Germans shelling sent a mass flight into the lake, the heavy guns driving them on the very night the lake freezes over. Soon, all fixed in place, a thousand frozen faces as it's sliced clean by an ax, caught in last living grimaces of terror and torment. On Lake Laduga's vast sheet of white marble rested a thousand cavalry horses' heads stuck out of the crust of ice. Thank you, Jack. And um, I was very fortunate that Jack was one of my teachers, so really, really pleased to have him reading at the open mic tonight. This is a great open mic. Thank you, all of you. All right, Powderworks writers. Okay, so we're a local writers group in Albany, and what we like to do is get up um, together and read on a theme uh, one right after the other. So we're just going to go straight through the three poems. Hi, I'm Amy Appel. Red. The Chinese use red as the color of celebration, auspicious New Year's fortuitous marriages. The bride wears red. Red is the liquid amber tree I see from my bedroom window in autumn, rich and beautiful. Red is energy, the sun shining through the blood vessels in my closed eyelids, warm, alive. But red is also the color of agitation dysregulation, terror, seeing red. Red is the matador's cape waved in front of an angry bull, a state you do not want to be in, a kind of dystopia into which your neurology transports you through some mysterious ripple in time. It is so hard to get out of the red zone. Red used to be my favorite color, but now I am not sure. It is so primary, primal, primitive. Give me something more complex, more subtle. My wedding dress was spring bud green with violet blue flowers. Life affirming, but not red. Red. 
There's a photograph of a little girl, strawberries embroidered on her polyester shirt. She holds a plastic bubble wand with the same kind of tension a hanging mobile has or a bow for a violin as it's poised before playing the first note. It's her first camping trip, first time barefoot outside. Bubbles in one hand, she looks through the wand and sees something red down low to the ground under leaves and dirt. Tiny, bright, and round as toadstools in a picture book. Her mommy says they're wild, wild, like wild dogs or bears. She's tasting them. Her mommy says they're good. Just the smell alone is sticky, sweet, as longed-for lip gloss, milkshakes, birthday cake, strawberries, real ones. Her teeth and tongue sink in and sink indefinitely, her fingers already clutching for more. She looks up finally to sunset, harmonica, and guitar, seeing men with no shirts and long hair smelling weed and campfire smoke near Woodstock, New York. Somewhere close by, the shirtless, long-haired people danced in the rain and the sun to music so wild. It made no sense at all, not knowing she'd always be imprinted with this particular romance, the incense of marijuana, when to a five-year-old it is perfume the incense of free love, a sense of excitement under the sky, the finding of a wild red strawberry. Can she reclaim that introduction to the color red? I'm Audrey Sable. Red. Oh, glasses. Red is the color of the earth upon which your dust billowed away and settled into the desert river. A river otter, I followed you, nostrils above water, seeking your musk, until I was bewildered, alone, near the absolute. And I drew myself up on a red mud riverbank, waiting for Epimetheus, under a purple sky held by mammoth cairns, columns of shadows turning day from reds to brown. At desert dusk, the canyon wren rouses me, regenerated from cool mud, and gifted by myth, I catch a red river fish with one blue eye. Desert star dazzle on slick river darkness, I swim upstream, upstream back to rejoin my kin in the last plum light. Sleek fur bodies entwine me after humming my crossing home beneath the desert night sky of Milky Way Dome. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Claude Convert. Claude Convert. Um, two necklaces. Once there were one, a whole pool of memories in which I dipped my fingers, the pearls I cried, the hard bone of a young deer, a lost ruby replaced by glass, an opal belonging to me before I was born, a stone with a hole I found on a North Beach sea, no, on a North Sea beach. How many beads does it take to swallow a neck into beauty? Under the waters I met last are colors I stole from my own garden. Come, come, they say, we want to play like evening stars on an early morning. Sometimes a thread needs to break to let shine a rainbow. Glass, bone, amber, stone, around your neck they look like the world two times around. Now, let down your hair.
Thank you. Rob Lipton. It's really nice night tonight. Really glad I've been involved with this. Um, this is kind of a flash fiction y prose poem y thing. Yeah, kind of. I don't know. Recap I behave badly at the funeral. Funerals should include flowers that give the impression of life, black tulips or parasites. They drain their colors from the juices of more responsible plants. It was made incumbent on me to throw every last one of these things into the trash before they put you into the ground. That they claimed the flowers were standard issue, funeral, home certified was immaterial. I wasn't fooled. And the casket, although of a high rubbed gloss, wasn't teak. It would not withstand severe rains or floods, so I removed you, albeit gently, from the casket. Of course, I was forced to brandish my revolver, so John Wilkes Booth threatened the priest and to enlist the unwilling assistance of my remaining niece. And at this point, I couldn't help but notice that your clothes were a certain horror, your dress out of style years ago. I stripped you bare. They hadn't even thought to include your special underwear. You know, the, per the red lacy ensemble. And I noticed that the mortician had completed only the most cursory of efforts on your wounds. It wasn't so much the entrance wounds, but the gaping exit wounds in your back and neck, laced up like loose tennis shoes, the edges of your flesh pouting purple. This was most disconcerting, enough so, you understand, gentle one, to force me, with no warning or desire, into squeezing the trigger of the pistol and to destroy my niece's left foot. Imagine my predicament. She's crying something awful, but more importantly, she can't help me with you. I can laugh now, but at that point, and I know you'll understand, all restraint became futile. I'm sorry. I pulled the trigger again and again, hitting you pointlessly and putting a stop to my niece's extraordinary noises. It was one of those act of God situations, mercy killing, murder, suicide, botched, fill aside. We can agree to disagree. Yes, at this point in time, you're dead as if you could know, but look what a mess I'm still in and you're not even an appropriate date anymore. Relationships are always a struggle, and ours is at a low point now. That was dark. <laughs> that, that, you guys, was dark. <laughs> All right, Lenore Weiss. In Istanbul, faith has no name. Old men talking on park benches sound the same in every country, a soft humming of the same tune. Witnesses to toppled governments, news of sickness, grinding bad business, or help extended from a distant relative. Some old men sit and read a book. A single finger holds their place. Today it's about a cat that stalks a pigeon. I sit in a cafe and drink Turkish coffee. A woman balances breakfast on her knees. I pass through three security gates, climb two sets of stairs enter the women's section of the Sephardic temple. The song of the cantor leaves a fragrance in the air, an incense of belief travels on the sob of gulls. I leave tomorrow. I will not hear the call of the Iman on the last day of Ramadan. The internet will inform me of more bombings and killings. I want to ask why faith must be named, why belief must be branded, why Arabs and Hebrews can't walk down the same street together. 
Faith is an arch protecting the weirs of our minds. It's my own voice talking to myself. Thank you. Thank you. Judy Wells. I'm going to read a poem from my book, um, The Glass Ship. And I got inspired by um, the red theme that the trio had. And uh, it's basically about an Irish female Odysseus traveling around to various islands. It's mythology. When, it, when you get older, you start going into fantasy because it gets too dark. <laughs> there are too many medical issues going on. Red Sea, Red Island. It was not wine dark nor scarlet, but rather a watery pale red, the sea I sailed to Red Island. When I stepped ashore, I thought I had to be ready for combat. I was wrong. All I found was an island of elegant red Irish setters who lapped my hand with their pink tongues, scarlet cardinals with punk hairdos and black eyes and seas of swarming red ants. Curiously, the ants did not sting me. Instead, they were intent on building large towers out of red sand. They did not seem to live in them. I discerned these red ants were artists building for aesthetic pleasure. As I wandered further inland, followed by the great pack of red Irish setters, I came upon a huge garden of red roses. They seemed to be crying, exuding red dew from their exquisite petals. I bent towards one large red rose and thought I heard a voice say, we were once human, all of us. Now we are flowers, we die in a day. If you want to save yourself from our fate, race toward the apple tree and eat. I wildly looked around and saw a small compact tree just outside the huge garden of roses. I picked the shiniest red apple from the heaviest bough and sunk my teeth into its flesh. A tingling sensation rushed over my body and I glanced down at my bare forearm. Silky red hairs were pushing from my flesh everywhere. I raced toward my boat, hastily jumped in, and watched the pack of Irish setters howling on the shore as red retreating waves carried my boat out to sea. Thank you. Dale Jensen. Uh, thank you. It's the month of Halloween, and also Robert writes uh, dog poems, and Alan has done some dog poems. So, Finding Bones. Someday a dog will get loose. Find the patch of land just far enough past the yard. Dig them up, the bones, the ones the police looked for for 20 years before they got back into their cruisers and headed for the home planet. The force of narrative will goad the dog into carrying the bones home, despite their glittery brightness, their strange, really strange taste in his mouth. And he, he will guard them as his own, despite the will of the pack leader in the house. Even when you think you're small, some things are your own. Let me say that again. Even when you're small, some things are your own. A dog could think that. A dog can think. And they found that the genes that make small dogs small don't make them think they're small. The class system here is purely physical. 
and you don't have to think about it if no one else can steal your treasures. Thank you. Uh, Lydia Efron. Uh, yeah, you usually write better. Oh. <laughs> well. I've never been, as they'd say on I Love Lucy, I've never been so humiliated in all my life. <clears throat> okay. Um, I wrote this poem a couple of months ago, but I want to read it. Um, in honor of Breast Cancer Awareness Month, which is also this month. Voyage. Can you hear me? Am I? Mm. Watch the silver moon shine on the dark river. In our brittle canoes, we paddle briskly forward. The dead leaves, jagged rock, and smooth stones, brilliant beneath our maiden crafts. Mighty trees, rooted in unimaginable forevers, steal only swift moments of our illumination. We stay afloat, we make ripples. Thank you. John Miro. about his, uh, or what part of it, it just seemed to be that everything was the opposite of what I do. He could laugh, and everything was, was very funny. Um, I seem to write therapy. Uh, this is about my son. I, I may have done this before, but I just came from the hospital and in San Leandro, so uh, I wanna, I wrote it probably 17 years ago, the year, uh, a year after he became mentally ill. And um, so I, I thought there was recovery, but apparently mental illness is something that has to be worked on. I wrote, uh, my love for you is everything. You're my light, my darling. My love for you is everywhere, in the sea, in the air. Will you walk? Oh dear, forgetting it. I should have gotten the words. It's okay. Just start over. Yeah. Will you walk? My love for you. If it doesn't work this time, I'm walking. <laughs> for you is everything. You're my light. My darling. My love for you is everywhere. In the sea. In the air. Will you walk into the light, feel the freedom of the night? Now that you're the victor of the past, will you recognize your strength? Then go to any length that it takes to make that freedom last. Will you do what you can do to make the path <laughs> so that you can have the future of your choice? Will you listen to the wisest word, then give some thought to what you heard before putting those thoughts to a voice? My love for you is everything.
everything. You're my light, my darling, my love for you is everywhere in the sea in the air do you know how much i think that, i think i've gone the limit sorry i'll bring the words next time <laughs> Thank you so much, Joan. Thank you. Uh, Don Hagelberg. Hey, hey! Finished greeting. <laughs> this um, poem is entitled Melala, Woman of the Book. And it's dedicated to Malala Yufasai. Girl of courage, woman of courage, thank you for standing and speaking out, speaking threads of shock meaning woven into hope's shawl, worn to protect the innocent from the spit of hate. Pakistani, what deep, deep irony to be shot and abandoned to die by atheists, only to rise up from those dead in consciousness. Plated in steel your thoughts when spoken out to the listening and the unlistening, cause others to twirl and reel in ecstasy. Rabia, ah, Rabia, sing and then sing once again. Stand up for women with the book being taught to both men and women in order to teach them how to rule with the other without the more hairy of the genders smothering mothers, daughters, and wives suffocated, quiet, underneath the know-nothing pillow of ignorance. Thank you. Christina Hutchins. wonderful reading tonight and also um, thank you Catherine and Dan who's in the back is the librarian who is here all the time and um, and this is um this is long after his paid hours so yeah I know but it's still nice um, so I'm kind of in a season of revision uh, I'm glad of it and this poem um, is dedicated to the physician of Rachmaninoff. Um, he spent three years, um, speaking of mental health, he spent three years um, depressed and psychotic and in a, he couldn't compose. And his doctor worked with him like with conventional medicine and also sat and held both his hands for hours and hours and hours. Um, so he dedicated the second piano concerto to him, um, Dr. Rollin Dahl. This is called Bell Effect. I woke in the night to a dreaming bird singing aloud in its sleep. My lover had recently left me. I was alone, desolate. And this is a true account, a real song the birds, but I was the one who woke. 
The bird's soul was in my ear. Maybe such a singing, a bird in its sleep, comes only long after Eden and finds itself dispersed, sounding out magnitudes of the dark. If you listen for it, you can hear the bell effect of Rachmaninoff's second concerto. When the piano comes alive under your hands, its first intervals sound the great bass bells of the monastery near his grandmother's farm, until a physician helped him back to himself and into the opening measures Rachmaninoff had composed nothing for years, a relentless desolation, native sadness, failed loves. Finally came the rhythms, and the C minor chords alternated with themselves, a dissonant D flat added and taken away, the tolling anchored by the piano's low A flat, by the largest cast bell in the world and a small eavesdropping boy, the orthodox overtones disclosing vast Russian distances. To me, it sounded like when the bird sang, it was dreaming its own perch amid leaves folding the dark. My heartbeat had become a little loose out of my chest. The way I know leaf shadows sometimes seize the garden wall on the side I can't see from the place I'm standing. Sergei's grandmother spread the blue pieced quilt on the grass, cotton her own mother had stitched, worn into tiny soft tears, everywhere a little transparent. The two of them ate cherries swinging them by their stems. Lying on their backs, they watched wind take up the tree, and maybe they became shadows. At the pounding fists of a monk, the bells sounded. So many hands have never touched me, but have saved my life. Thank you. Thank you, Christina. Um, Melissa Hobbs. Well, we had Halloween. This is a Christmas in Wyoming. Hosting here a wreck, a neck turned, fell short. Rig cantilevered, the back wheel collapsed, wedged in the gully. Cars athwart the ice slick mop of pavement. Orange cones funnel the four lanes to one. Cherry lozenge breaks in the throat of night. Hunger rumbles miles from the last gas station. Dreaming of Christmas hosts, drivers glimpse tree lights beyond the blown snow. But radios blast his surly sound bite. Panning my handheld to capture the moon, the shoulder jacked my mail truck off the asphalt. Craniums, elbows, fits exasperate. Hours of hands wrapping red and green ribbons. Boxes cartwheel into dark. Thrown from open doors. Love nosedives under Wyoming wind's wheel. Where hope condenses to steel all eventually. What is there to toast when Christmas gives glass fragments? Raise something against the wind. Touch hands through glass, surviving. Drive on through the one-lane dream. Thank you. Victor. This is entitled, One Day Abroad at Night on Heaths of Countryside, I found a glow as lit the trees around today. 
a brilliancy in a basket carried by a man dressed all in purest white who stood feet wide up staring at the sink of starry sky and I approached. Good evening, sir, and what are you about? Good evening, he replied. I am seeing to the stars, preserving brightness. And so saying, up he reached into the midnight and he grasped a flicker in Orion's belt and brought it down a glowing in his hand. And from the sky, the star was gone. The points of twinkle on this star have dulled and need replacement. And he saying, from his basket plucked a bright indeed, and up he reached to then replace it in Orion's belt. There, that's better. See how sharp? And I said, and sure the stars returned, as though it was the course of things and utterly a casual of routine, replaced better and brighter than before. And there he spoke and pointed to the dipper. The smallest of them's gone from steel blue to gray and needs renewal. And will you try? And then up I reached, and to my surprise, instead of air, a point of warmth and light I touched, and grabbing, pulled it down. Well done, he said, and picked a little steel blue bright from out the basket. Here, he said, and handed it, put it up. And again I reached and placed it where I remembered. Good, he said. You've placed it square exactly where the star should be. You've natural ability. As well I knew, as I could see celestiality a swim and swirl within you. Now let's try another. And he handed me a bright and yellowish. There were archers out the bow of Sagittarius, and he pointed. I reached up then, and I plucked it and replaced it. Good, well made. Now I have a proposition for you. Apprentice here with me on earth, for only from this earth may stars be plucked away and down to be replaced. Only earth and dreams reach far enough to touch, to touch the stars. And though the circumstance was stunning, marvelous, and novel new, I then agreed to be apprentice as though the obvious and natural act and path. And said he, good then, meet me here this time next week. And week on week, we worked the constellations and renewed the distant spots of galaxies, replaced them whole. And then a year and two, and soon I soloed as he stood abeyance. You are ready, he said, you're a master. Never seen it done so fast and well. Next week, I'll stay at home. You come and work. I trust you. And here's the basket. You will find it ever does replenish. And so he showed up less and less. And finally, one night, he came and draped upon his arm his bright white, pure white suit of clothes, fresh pressed, and he proffered them to me. Here, now it's, oh, I have a theme song. Here, now it's official. We've permission. Now you've got my job and I'll return knowing that I can retire with the stars well cared for thanks to you. Now till I kick off, I'll visit friends in far dimensions and relax. I've earned it. You'll do well. I've never seen it done so carefully and fast and I'm the lucky one. And so good night. Perhaps one day I'll look in once again. And the clothes? You'll find they never soil. And saying so, he walked away into the trees. So here I am about the work that needs a doing. And as long as I've the job, I am immortal. And I run around the galaxies at will. And with the eons, will the brightness of the stars diminish and the basket's brightness ebb. And in time, and in time, turn in turn, my own apprentice will arrive. It's all prepared. So here I stand with glowing basket in my hand, all dressed in purest white and blank, upon enchanted earth beneath the beautiful night. 
earth and solely earth, where we may reach and pluck to then renew the brightness of the stars until the stars and all do cease. Thus I and all my brethren and my sisterin, the rainbow painters, sunset tinters, adjusters of celestial orbits, the tuners and mellifluers of sweet bird song, the inflectors of the lover's sigh, inspectors of our fond remembrances, and the myriads more who serve as I. We on and on replenish and replenish eons hence, till all, all falls and falls to simple be again, and reigns sweet silence then, sends time, till roused our universal eye again then wakes its sight to loving commerce. So now, good night. Thank you, and um, good night. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Robert Sward. Thank you, Alan Sadovsky. Sadovsky. Thank you, Albany Library. Thank you, Dan, and all of you. And I hope to. And thank you, Catherine Taylor. Thank you.